South Asian? <laughs> Tough question for us Parsis. Hello to everybody who's just joined and welcome. Shaban Vivo 1951, everybody. South Asian? <laughs> Tough question for us Parsis. Welcome to Haika. Hello to everybody who's just joined and welcome. Shaban Vivo 1951. Can you all see my screen? Yeah. Yes. Okay. Should we give it a few more minutes? No, I think we should start. Sure. It's possible. We'll get started. Yeah. Welcome everyone and good afternoon. Thank you for joining us today for our parallel event on women's empowerment with digitization in the pre and post COVID era. My name is Afrid Mistry, and um, I am currently the United Nations representative for Hazana and also the co-chair of their UN NGO committee. My fellow co-chair, Dr. Brown Pastakia, is also here today. Our organization is called Fazana, which stands for Federation of Zoroastrian Associations of North America. It is a faith-based organization and the members are followers of the religion called Zoroastrianism. Fizana was founded in 1987 and it serves as the coordinating body for 28 Zoroastrian associations throughout the US and Canada. And Fizana promotes the study and understanding and practice of the Zoroastrian faith. It also represents the interests of its member associations and carries out philanthropic and charitable activities worldwide. The Fizana Journal, which is the publication of record, circulates to Zoroastrian households in more than 22 countries, as well as to libraries, scholars, and religious organizations worldwide. For more information, you can visit our website, fizana.org, or connect with us on social media. In this panel discussion, we will cover topics relating to digitization pre and post COVID concerning women. The issues we'll be covering are related to mental health, society, technological accessibility, and women's safety. The panel will also provide actionable ideas for wider implementation. Our first speaker today will be Dr. Farah Shroff, Farah is a visionary Canadian public intellectual with expertise in global public health research and education. She is a policy expert and has worked within and for many governments in Canada and elsewhere. Her research areas are in integrative health approaches such as Ayurveda and yoga and social environmental justice from a feminist anti-racism decolonial lens. Speaking French, Spanish, and English, she has worked in many nations as an educator in academia and other communities. She founded and leads Maternal and Infant mm -hmm. Health Canada, a global public mm -hmm. health collaborative aiming to improve the well-being of women, young ones, and the environment. Harvard School of Public Health recently awarded her a mid-career fellowship, recognizing her expertise in global public health. She works as an independent consultant, a faculty member at the University of British Columbia, and a teacher of yoga, dance, meditation, and other mind-body activities. Dr. Shroff is regularly featured in the media. Please join me in welcoming Farah. Thank you so much, Afrid. It is absolutely my delight to be here. And I would like to wish all of the people who have joined us a very good afternoon, good evening, and good morning. Welcome. I'll be talking about the theme of the CSW, which is technology, and I will be talking specifically about harnessing technology to improve women's health based on a study um, that I did 
uh, last year and was published uh, while I was at Harvard. Okay. So I have a, a little overview of what we're doing here. We're going to do a, a land acknowledgement. We're going to talk about women's health, just sort of a temperature check of where we're at at this time. We're gonna to try to do some visioning for better health. We're gonna then talk about the study, the questions, methods, results, policy recommendations. And then I'm gonna tell you a story which also came out of the study, a story that really illustrates how technology did make a difference in women's health, one person's life. And then I'm gonna tell you a little bit about um, a mental health campaign that Maternal and Infant Health Canada ran. All right. So this is a, a picture which is on our theme that the New York Times had looking at technologies and women's lives. And I'd like to acknowledge that I currently am on the land of the Lenape Nation here in New York City. And it is a beautiful city, so I offer gratitude uh, for all of their stewardship of this land. And just to acknowledge that wherever you are, all of you, that you are also on land that has been stewarded by Indigenous communities and a great debt of gratitude that, that we owe to them. So just wanted to check with um, your Zoom hands or your, your own hands, uh, just who's here. And if you, if you can just put your hand up, if you are a community member in our, um, in our ethnocultural and faith-based community, if you are a Zakdushti community member, please put your hand up or your Zoom hand. Welcome to all of you. Okay, who here considers themselves a women's right, rights activist? Anybody, hands up. Okay, I see some hands up. Anybody here from government? I see a few hands there, okay. How about um, non-governmental um, folks here? Any hands? Okay, and then um, students. Anybody a student here? Yeah, okay, fabulous, great. I see a few students and then scholars. Who considers themselves a scholar, um, researcher, uh, intellectual, writer, anything like that? Okay, I see a few people there and, okay, and activists in general, who, who else considers themselves just an activist, like somebody who wants social change and big changes? All right, okay, good. I, now I get a sense of who is in our Zoom room. Um, and if there's any, any category that you belong to that I've missed, please put a little chat message and, and let us know who you are. You are all welcome. Everybody here, welcome. So we are, those of us who are here in New York City, at the largest gathering of women in the world. This is the Commission on the Status of Women, and we are collectively creating visions and paths to better well-being and human rights for those who identify as women all around the world. The objectives of my part of the talk are to discuss how to improve women's health with digital technologies based on this study that I was the Prime, uh, principal investigator of. And, uh, and also, I would like to see if there's somebody here today who would like to do a collaborative project. Let's take a little moment, all of us here now, and just ask, what is the state of global women's health now in this post-pandemic moment here in 2023 in, in March in uh, International Women's Month. I'll, I'll start us off. Um, uh, we know that the United Nations has said that women's, women's conditions in, in, in almost every area have been rolled back decades. Um, it's a tough time. School closures, declining incomes, large scale and domestic violence have had a big impact on women's health. We also know that hunger, addictions, overdoses, mental health crises, survival sex, and many chronic conditions are on the horizon, if not already in stages where they would have been if they had been caught earlier at a better place. But I just want to ask you now, um, I'm going to just stop my screen and I just want to ask you if you have other thoughts that you would like to share. And I really encourage you to do that. Um, whether you work in women's health itself or you have thoughts, what are your thoughts about where we are now? 
please feel free to raise your hand, say something in the chat. You can unmute yourself. Marijuana, what do you think? Hi. Um, gosh. Uh, I just had a, emails about families, uh, refugee families from Syria coming to Canada, to the Victoria where I live. And um, uh, the women and men and children are all, you know, suffering so much. But it, I think women are often the fulcrum for uh, a lot of stress uh, between the children, not able to get out as much as the men, not that independent. So it's for many, many people, they're in, in at the worst situation. And of course, we know the situation in Iran. It's horrendous. Yeah. Yes. And that's uh that is criminal and so blatant and evil. So it's and then of course elsewhere as well. But I just stopped there. Okay, thank you so much, Dr. Engineer. Okay, I'm gonna ask if there's anybody else. Okay, um, Anahita. Anahita, go ahead. Um, I just want to say that um, currently, I think uh, hazardous to women's health and education is mainly coming even from some governments. Uh, I mean, earlier we were expecting governments to promote women's health and education, but right now, these days, we're it seems that we're moving backward, and we're seeing even dangers coming from governments. Yeah, that's a very, very, very good point in women's health. Thank you, Anahita. And Dr. Duster, please go ahead. Last comment, okay? Yeah, I, I want to uh, say what Anahita was just mentioned, that because since the COVID and since the patriarchal society is becoming so prominent in the government representatives, our women's health is really going backwards. We are really one step forwards and 100 steps backwards now, you know, so we have to do uh, get together and do something about it to stop this decline. Yes, yes, thank you. Yeah, absolutely. That's a, <laughs> it's kind of a sad state of affairs, isn't it? But uh, it, it it is kind of where we're at. Okay, so that's important to sort of to start, you know, with our baseline. Where are we at? So um, I want to now say that we are also at a moment a potential great change, a moment where we really could be at a turning point. And we'll start with a lovely quote from Arundhati Roy, who said that this pandemic is a portal. She said that historically pandemics have forced humans to break with the past and imagine their world anew. This one is no different. It is a portal, a gateway between one world and the next. So my friends, let's pivot from where we just were to, to be ready to imagine another world and ready to fight for it. There's that world, we can see it, right? All right, so it was in this spirit that uh, I led a study um, with um, some co-investigators from around the world, Dr. Kranti Vora, Dr. Nora Schwartz, and Dr. Rania al um, uh, and. And we asked this broad research question, how can changes engendered through the pandemic be a catalyst for improving women's health? And the sub question was what policies are required to build a more equitable post COVID-19 world with the goal of creating a more equitable post COVID-19 world. This study was led and read, uh, by Maternal and Infant Health Canada. We did our methods were a, um, a survey and four focus groups. We asked women's health experts from Canada, the USA and Mexico, Egypt and Sudan and India. And I ran a, a, a pretest in Mexico with global health experts and another pretest as well. So it was a pretty robust methods. All right, so what I wanna ask you now is, is this a once in a lifetime opportunity? We have seen things in the past few months or past couple of years that we've never seen. We saw the sky in Beijing, we saw the sky in Delhi, we saw the air clean in places where we never thought that could happen. 
So in the world of women's health and women's well-being, what does a better world look like? How can we make this happen? So what we're going to do now is we're going to use the chat and the whiteboard. So I'm going to stop um, stop sharing my screen. And um, Afrid is going to pull up the whiteboard. And I encourage you to use this whiteboard and start writing some things. It's, it's important to start with where we're at. And now what we're doing is saying, but where do we want to be? We don't have to get stuck where we are. It otherwise gets to be really, really dreary. Um, and so let's get to this place where we're looking at where we want to be. And I see a lot of you on the whiteboard. Please do a little drawing or do um, whatever moves you to talk about where you would like us to be with women's health. And, and in my work, I, I talk about mental health physical health, as well as spiritual health. So wherever you are in, in that um, piece of it, if you're with all of them, I see somebody writing equitable. That's a beautiful world, word. Um, yeah, feel free to write, draw, do whatever you want to do. Ah, I see a nice little sticky coming up there that um, Merzarin has put up. In sync with, I see that coming up. Thank you. In sync with human rights, beautiful. And having enough money. Yeah, that's like public health 101. Thank you for saying that. Inclusive, beautiful. Yes, safe, absolutely. All of these things are going to be good for women, for women's health. Hormozad Setna, thank you for, for saying, for, for your contribution there. Rita, Paroja, Afrid Zabalda, Anaita. I'll wait an, another few moments and then we're going to move on. Uh, move into the 21st century. Thanks, Hormzad. Yes, absolutely. It feels like sometimes we're going back, especially because like Marwan was talking about Iran, thinking about Afghanistan as well. It does feel like we're not in this century, right? Thanks for saying that. Okay, and uh, oh, okay, and we've got some nice comments in the chat here. Um, we've got offering a fresh perspective to offer solutions. That's beautiful. And um, Shanali says, focusing on all areas of well being physical well being, economic well being, psychological, emotional, social, spiritual, and environmental well being. Beautiful. Thank you. And Lily. Metta says the new world of remote work has helped provide flexibility. Thank you. I'm actually going to talk about that. Uh, and then Jen has talked about what we talked about at the beginning. Yeah, Iran currently. Yes, sad, but there is hope as long as we are doing what we're doing. Okay, it's easy to look abroad. Yes, and then American problems. Yes, thank you. Thank you. Okay, and the SDGs. Okay, beautiful. Thank you very, very much for all your contributions. I'm going to read this last one that I see here, affordable services. Yes, we talk about that a lot in health. All right. I am going to close our whiteboard and thank you for your participation in it. And really good to, to, uh, to try to do a little bit of collective dreaming. I think that's super important at this time that we're at, my friends. So what did our experts say? What did the, what the people that we asked in our study? Some of the things that you said are what they said. So we came up with, with, with three main, um, main themes based on what came out of our focus groups. Uh, you'll see them there, um, digital technology, to improve women's social and clinical determinants of health. Uh, we, they, we talked about flexible workplace locations, something that somebody already mentioned in the chat, as well as telemedicine, which includes telepsychiatry and telecounseling. And then we have a, some critiques of that as well. It's not this um, absolute panacea. And then the other two themes, which I won't have any time to talk about, were a greater emphasis on mental health and well being. Um, so, mental. So mental health um, and then supporting frontline workers, really, really important um, through this pandemic. Uh, so more PPE, better living wages and paid sick leave. All right. So here are what some of the people said about digital technologies and working from home. Now, you might not think this is directly relevant to women's health. 
but I'm talking about it now here in terms of the social determinants of women's health and these things that are really, really critical actually to well-being. So what did people say? A Canadian participant said, ensure that people who normally wouldn't have technology, including people with disabilities and seniors, have the technology and develop the skill set to be able to access programming online. So the, again, the pandemic was a portal for people who normally didn't have access to things. And so we're very, um, very much hoping that these things continue. All right. <clears throat> so uh, very similar from another part of the world, an Egyptian and Sudanese participant or, or Egyptian or Sudanese participant said, why not save time? All this effort just to reach your office. Now, remember, friends, those of you who live in cities that take you two to three hours um, per day to get back and forth to the office, all of a sudden our participants were telling us that now they had these two to three hours a day they could spend time with their loved ones. If they were care providers of children or elderly or others, they now had time for themselves as well. A lot of self-care came about because women were not commuting to and from the office. This was a game changer. And then uh, one of our uh, Latinx, our USA Mexico participants said, optimizing technology has been a silver lining. I think we have all developed new skills because of that. Before it was mostly in-person training. Now we have access to international training and information at the tip of our hands or at websites. So a lot of people got new training and got access to people from different countries and different places. It really, really helped people leapfrog in terms of their knowledge and their network. So working um, from home and digital technologies for uh, in terms of the in terms of telemedicine and telepsychiatry and telecounseling also allowed practitioners to work from home, which was really important in a time with the uh, viral outbreaks. Um, so this provided th this from a practitioner perspective um, uh, gave practitioners who otherwise couldn't have been in their clinics or in the hospital, aging ones, immunocompromised practitioners, gave them the opportunity to still keep um, uh, providing care to their patients. And then for um, rural, remote, and transport-challenged patients all over the world, digital technologies really ramped up during the pandemic. Not that they hadn't been there before, and not that people hadn't been asking them for them before, but the pandemic just made it so that people really moved very quickly. Uh, we saw how quickly um, a lot of the, the uh, digital technologies really ramped up. Um, we saw that people who didn't have access to a computer or a device, there were also innovations there. So in, in India, our participants told us that patients were able to go in a, in a village setting to a kiosk or a, a kind of a makeshift um, small clinic where the healthcare provider was then able to link them with a specialist or somebody who they needed help with. Could we have done this before? Yes. Did we do it before? No. <laughs> so in fact, what's really nice is that there were really benefits that came about at this time because um, necessity is the mother of invention. Uh, what we know is that digital technologies for medicine, for psychiatry, uh, for telecounseling are convenient for most people. We certainly know that they're cost effective. We, we, we skip out on the bricks and mortar aspect of the cost. And for somebody who's in a severe mental health crisis, this might be the only way that they're going to get access to care. And in fact, we saw a lot of good care happening be because, um, because of the ramping up of digital technologies, specifically for mental health. Uh, and, and we heard about that from India, from Egypt, Sudan, um, Canada, the US, our Latinx populations. It, this was a universal theme. So now, globally, we do know that despite the theme of the CSW, only 64% of people globally have access to the internet. That's that's not a majority in a big by a big big margin, right? Um, and we know that that those who identify as women actually have less access. Um, uh, so typically, say in some households, uh, research shows that if there's a smartphone in the family, it's usually with the male head of household. So if 
a, a woman or a, a girl child or an adolescent girl uh, needs to talk to her clinician, um, she has to she has to ask for that access from the male head of household. And if she's talking about a gynecological concern, these things start to get complicated. Um, so uh, we do live in a world where we need more digital democracy. We are not there yet, but you know, sixty four percent is better than forty four percent. So at least it's it, it, it's over fifty percent. Now, I, I told you that one of the objectives of my part of the presentation is that I want to do a pilot project. Our organization would like to do a pilot project exactly in this area because our study showed that this was exactly what people wanted. So we are looking for anybody, perhaps a tech company or perhaps one of you who's listening right now, to work with Maternal and Infant Health Canada to find a community somewhere. It could be anywhere in the world. Uh, we're, we're, we, we're a global public health organization. We speak many languages and work in different places places, we would like to do a project that offers broadband devices and training to a community that otherwise wouldn't have it specifically for women and, and others. So hold that in your back pocket and, and we'll, we'll connect if, if that, if that um, seems like something that you'd like to do. Okay, now let's do a little cautionary note here. Um, there are many, many human rights and surveillance issues related to digital technologies uh, from, from Facebook to almost every social media. We know that there are data thieves out there taking our data and our privacy and much of our really important personal information is being watched and sometimes stolen. From a health perspective, I'm a yoga teacher. I teach a lot of mind, body, and spirit practices. We know that our musculoskeletal system is being challenged. A lot of us are getting surgeon's neck or we're sticking our chins out too much. We're, we're furrowing our brows. Um, we're getting eye strain. There are lots of other issues uh, that come up for our health. There's also screen dependency disorder, and that absolutely got promulgated through the pandemic. People are looking at screens all the time and now getting almost addicted to screens. And then from a, a clinical perspective, we know that telehealth can lead to diagnostic mistakes. And when you get a diagnosis that is an error, that leads to a cascading spiral of interventions, which can um, you know, either do nothing uh, or, or, or cause harm. Um, and we do know that a lot of clinicians find that it's much harder to create a real clinical relationship um, over, over whatever technology it is, a video platform or a telephone based platform. So it's not all, um, it's not all perfect. And it's, it's not necessarily the direction that we that we um, want to be going in. Okay. Okay, so I am going to switch gears now and I'm going to tell you a story. Uh, as part of this study, we wanted to just see whether this, 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 the, these ideas could hang on, on one person's life. And so we found one person who was a member of our study community. Um, she, uh, her name is Claudio Lainez, and uh, she's given us full permission to share her story. And of course, I've gone through the IRB at, at uh, my university. So that's all fully, fully um, public. Um, and uh, Claudia is a Latinx person who lives in the United States. And so let me tell you a little bit about Claudia. I wish she could tell you herself, um, but unfortunately, she um, she wasn't able to be in our Zoom room today. Uh, Claudia has a very powerful story, and I won't be able to do justice to it, my friends. I will try my best to do it quickly and yet give you a gist of this really incredible person. So there's a picture of Claudia as a teen. She was uh, born in El Salvador. Uh, during the war, she was separated from her mother. Um, if you can imagine, she's a, she's a small child. She didn't see her mother until she was 15. So she was separated about uh, age two. She only found her mom, saw, saw her mom again at age 15. But by that time, her father's family and her had decided to leave El Salvador because of the situation there to settle in the United States. They came here and she continues to be in a very, very difficult situation uh, where her status is always in limbo. It's called temporary protection status or TPS. 
So after many years of being in the United States, Claudia got um, uh, got connected to a man. She left that relationship. She's now in her 40s. She's a single mom um, as a, a, and a woman who has left a violent marriage and who works with other women who have been in violent marriages. She does a lot of volunteer work to support people who have been violent marriages. Um, Claudia, once, as soon as she came, she worked um, cleaning jobs. She worked in fast food places. She worked as a veterinarian's assistant. She, she always wanted to be a veterinarian, but because she was on TPS, she wasn't able to get the student loans to go to vet school. So what did she do? She worked as a cleaner in the vet hospital. And from her cleaning job, she moved up and up and up until she became a vet assistance. And there you see her with some of her puppy patients. Um, there you see her getting um, a recognition award for her volunteer work. You can see with largely other um, Latina women or Latinx women um, here in the United States. Um, so early in the pandemic, she got a job actually working for the TPS Alliance. She was doing community organizing, advocacy, and, and activism work. Um, that work would normally have been a frontline job, going out and talking to people. But because of the pandemic, that job became remote. And so Claudia, who had not known how to use a lot of um, digital technologies, because she was now um, in this situation, got the chance to learn a lot of things. She learned Zoom and Excel and all kinds of things. And what she said is, it was a hard time, but it was also an opportunity to learn to do other things. So for me, it was a big, huge opportunity to learn to work from home. And so a whole new world opened up. She got these trainings in social media, Zoom, lots of different software. She told us she met people from Iran and all over the world. Of course, she hadn't met people from in different parts of the world before. Um, uh, and so here she was um, on, on Zoom, like we are right now, meeting new friends, creating digital community, expressing her ideas to a much larger audience than she had in the past. And there is an image of her presenting um, and facilitating a Zoom meeting. And then, um, so Claudia actually got COVID right, right at the beginning of the pandemic. And if you, um, in, here in New York City, if you read any of the coverage, you would have known that the Latinx community was hit really hard, really hard, and, and, and in like super tragic ways. But her story, um, it defies a lot of the stereotypes. She got COVID, she, her daughter got COVID, um, she recovered from COVID really well. People came, lots of her people came and gave her food and, and, and supported her in lots and lots of different ways. She felt a lot of love and support. And COVID wasn't really that big a deal for her. She did, however, have a persistent health problem, lots of pain, back pain. She couldn't sit for long hours. This was really starting to impact her. Finally, she got a diagnosis. She knew what it was. And now, because Claudia was working from home, she was able to take on the prospect of doing major surgery with a post-op recovery that her clinicians had told her would be three to six months. So because she was able to work from home and because she was really able to rest, she didn't need to go out early in the morning to get to work. She didn't need to be struggling on transit to get back. She did rest. And um, she was able to, to find the $7,000 she needed for the operation. And she really got better. So Clara, after you're her, almost at time if you want to wrap up soon. Yeah, absolutely. So after her surgery, Claudia was healthier than ever. And here's what she says. I decided to take a month off because I've been working for so many years. And then I was thinking, what do I want to do? I want to go back to work, but do I want to keep doing this? So we've seen that this moment for so many people has been an opportunity to reinvent everything what they're doing with their lives, what meaning their lives offer them, what they want to do with themselves. And that's exactly what she did. And so I, I'm super inspired by her. What she ended up doing um, was uh, 
packing up all her stuff. She'd never done this in the middle of the winter, driving across the United States. She got another activist job supporting day wage laborers, um, Latinx people, um, uh, from, uh, from making sure that they're going to get paid um, for their for their day, daily wages. So here's Claudia. There she is with her grandmother. There she is with an animal again. She really does love animals. Um, okay, so I am just going to finish off now and um, quote uh, one Persian poem because I love Persian poetry. Rumi said, your light is more magnificent than sunrise or sunset. And so once again, these are the themes of our study. You see that developing digital technologies was one of them, valuing frontline workers and promoting mental well-being. We have our um, policy recommendations here, bridging the digital divide through widespread provision of reliable internet services and affordable devices for digital literacy training um, uh, and for healthcare offering telemedicine, um, investing in patient-friendly di digital infrastructure and engaging and educating patients for telemedicine. Now, the, we did also do something on well-being. I'm a little concerned about time, so I don't think I can tell you very much about it, but I'll just briefly tell you that because um, uh, we, were, we were told by our participants that mental well-being was a huge issue and that we needed to break the stigma of mental well-being, Maternal and Infant Health Canada then ran a six-week campaign called Break the Stigma. And it's still available on our social media channels. You'll see it. Uh, it was done by our medical student, Madison Todd. Um, we talked uh, to people in Egypt, India, Sudan, all over. Um, so we use digital technologies again to try to break that stigma. Once again, here is the uh, digital abstract of our study. It was published um, a few months ago in the International Journal of Environmental Research and Public Health. So you can see it anywhere. You'll see that our we've got a Facebook, our Twitter, and our, um, our LinkedIn as well. Uh, we talked about Iran already. I would like to dedicate my portion of this talk to the brave women and people of Iran, uh, not just for their bodily autonomy, for their full fundamental human rights. And say her name. Her name was Masa Amani. All right, my friends. So in summary, digital technologies have improved women's lives. Women have benefited a great deal um, for working from home. Um, of course, they did do. They did have to do a little bit more work. There were some negatives, but by and large, our participants benefited from working from home. They benefited from telemedicine, telecounseling, um, and we want we would like to be bridging this digital divide and providing more access for women. If you're out there and you'd like to partner with us to do a pilot project, um, to do some work to provide more devices, broadband, and training, please reach out to me. Let's remember though. Technology is not a panacea, um, but it does have lots of benefits. Thank you so much. Merbani, Danyavad, muchas gracias, merci beaucoup, and shukran. I'm Farah Shroff. Okay, thank you, Farah. Now, our next speaker is Sharman Mistry. She is originally from Mumbai, India, and now residing in Toronto, Canada. Sharman is the Assistant Secretary of Fizana, and she is also a marketing graduate from Seneca College in Toronto. She currently works at Publis Media, which is a global media agency. As a woman empowerment advocate, her goal is to inspire Zoroastrian women to become an inspiration for other women through guidance, motivation, and mentorship. Please welcome Sharman Mystery. Thank you for the introduction, Afri. Really appreciate that. So as Ruth Bader Ginsburg once said, fight for the things you care about, but do it in a way that will lead others to join you. Well, ladies and gentlemen, today I will be presenting to you about the societal challenges, safety, and impact of digitization faced by women in pre and post COVID period. So when it comes to isolation and quarantine restrictions, it had a bigger impact on women, mainly in three major ways. First, there was an increase in domestic violence and mental health issues as a result of intense quarantine measures imposed 
all over the world. Second, more economic stress due to women losing their jobs as a result of the pandemic. And third, reduced access of support services, mainly lack of digital resources and education to women. So let's talk about uh, it in more in detail. Firstly, domestic violence. So can you guess the number of women who have been victims of domestic violence globally? Any guesses? in the chat okay no guesses so i'll go ahead and yeah so this is the exact number 243 million globally an estimate of 243 million women that is almost one in three women between 15 to 49 years of age have been subjected to physical or intimate partner violence before the outbreak of COVID-19. Emerging data and reports from those on the front lines have shown that all types of uh, violence against women and girls, particularly domestic violence, had intensified. This violence increase was due to growth in tension in households, rising perpetrators risk factors for violence, economic burden, and survivors' limited access to support services available pre-lockdown. COVID-19's response plan limited the spread of the virus. However, it weakened women's ability to respond to their violent perpetrators. Data shows an increase in calls to domestic violence helplines in many countries since the outbreak of COVID-19. By October 2021, 52 countries had integrated violence against women and girls prevention and response into COVID-19 plans. So big data analysis in eight Asian countries showed that internet searches related to violence against women and help seeking rose significantly during COVID-19 lockdowns. In fact, in France, the National Federation of Women Solidarity, which manages a major domestic abuse hotline, saw their shelters completely filled up during the first lockdown. They were forced to open more shelters for women seeking to escape abuse as callouts escalated. After the first lockdown, there were many cases of women and their children experiencing post-traumatic stress disorder. So let's talk about shadow pandemic. It's the term that is used to describe violence against women and girls during COVID-19. Social protection remains in the shadow of health protection. That's what everyone said. Most of the women around the world felt that the issue of domestic violence was never in the shadows. It was always present. However, it took an entire pandemic for people to finally accept the issue. So now I would like to talk about two stories of women-led initiatives from two different countries which took place during COVID-19 and has saved lives of many women from domestic violence. First is the story of Christina, a high school student in Poland who won a prize this year from European Union for setting up a fake cosmetic website which allowed women to report domestic uh, domestic abuse in a discreet way. So this is how it worked. When the user places a skincare item into their online, bas online basket, a series of coded questions are prompted from psychologists specializing in crisis intervention. They ask, for instance, how long the problem has been going for, whether it is impacted by alcohol, if the problem also affects their children. Lawyers were also involved and based on the responses, the authorities will be called to check in. So when this was asked uh, to Christina about uh, the entire situation by a news channel, she said, I thought I would help one person or maybe two. I'm shocked that there was a need for me to even create the website and that it wasn't a government initiative at all and that so many people needed it. It was because of an increase in domestic violence case, cases due to the pandemic. Because of that, I decided to face this problem and try to help these people. 
Till date, her Facebook page named Camomiles and Pansies has helped around 350 women report cases of abuse. Next is the Signal for Help initiative by the Canadian Women's Foundation created in response to domestic violence during, uh, during the pandemic. It was a simple one-handed sign that someone could use on a video call. It helps a, a person silently show they need help and want someone to check in with them in a safe way. As a result, the signal had gone viral all over social media. Some of us might have seen it on TikTok. I saw it on TikTok for sure. Um, and the campaign video had been viewed on YouTube over 1 million times. Currently, it's on 2.2 million views. That's crazy, right? And news about the signal had been shared through hundreds of media stories. A 2020 poll found that about one in three people in Canada know of or have seen using that sign. And it has been shared in 44 countries, including Japan, Italy, England, the US, Brazil, and France. Most recently, it has been recognized by the Cannes Lion International Festival of Creativity and 2021 Marketing Awards. So how can we help? Of course. And there are six ma main ways in which you can help right now to avoid domestic violence. First, awareness. Let's talk about the issue with more and more people around you. Because the more you spread awareness, the better it is. Second, creation of safe place. Developing an environment for everyone to talk about it. Because the more you talk about it, the more it spreads. Third, know the signs. Be aware of the warning signs of domestic violence and also the red flags. Fourth, speak up. Organize talks, campaigns to spread awareness. Just like this one, you can talk more about it and people will know and are aware about it. Fifth, listen. If someone talks about the issue, listen without judgment because you never know. It might mean a lot to them. Sixth, check in. Reach out to anyone around you who, who you think might be in danger or already experiencing domestic violence. So economic stress. Again, a question. Guess the amount of income women lost due to COVID-19. Any guesses? Let's see the chats. You can put the dollar amount in the chat window. Yep. Okay. No guesses. Okay. No guesses. Oh, 10% is very less still. You'll be shocked. Hundreds of billions was one guess by Shivam. Okay. No. Millions. Yeah, million percent. More than millions, but okay. Okay, I'll just say it. It's $800 billion. Shocking, right? In 2020 alone, women globally lost more than 64 million jobs, which equals to 5% of total jobs held by women. These are the reports from Oxfam International. By comparison, 3.9% of men's jobs were, lo uh, were lost last year. This cost women around the world at least $800 billion in earnings, a figure that is more than the combined GDP of 98 countries. Unemployment data indicate that women make up to 54% of ob overall job losses to date. Not only did women suffer a disproportionate share of job losses, but research suggests that their hours of unpaid labor increased as they undertook more than their share of childcare, homeschooling, and elder care. Let's talk about it globally. In Peru, for example, the pandemic had pushed more women than men out of formal employment. Peru saw one of the world's most dramatic drop in employment during the pandemic. 
the the country went into strict lockdown in mid march 2020 and by the end of june 2020 labor force participation rates had fallen 20 percent points among men and 25 percent among women this is the data from international labor organization itself second france in france the social safety net failed to protect all women though early research suggests that social welfare programs may have cushioned the fall across the european union thailand when pandemic related tra travel restrictions hit thailand's tourism sector women bore the brunt Three, 339,000 fewer women were employed in the second quarter of 2020 compared with 5,500 fewer male workers according to the international labor organization data in thailand 30 percent of women work in sectors vulnerable to the economic effects of the pandemic such as retail manufacturing and accom accommodation and food services according to international labor organization data next india in india women made up 20 percent of workforce before covid 19 their share of job losses resulted from the industry mix alone is estimated 17%, but unemployment survey suggests that they actually counted for 23% of overall job losses. So let's talk something about positivity, since we've already spoken about the negative effects. Uh, so Ethiopia's positive response to, uh, to avoid this gender gap was like this. Through their productivity safety net project, which targets low-income households, often female-headed, to ele uh, elevate them out of poverty, they took a step which is sort of shocking and a good initiative, which all of us should uh, be inspired um recipient of the program received an advance of three months payment while on leave from their public work obligation and were also allowed to withdraw 50 percent of their savings and encourage aspect of program to cover expenses so the next one is super special for me because it has impacted my life and my job as well and um, Monday Girl, a Canadian women-led networking group that started with an idea of empowering women to create their own network and help each other in terms of recruitment and career growth by sharing required resources, tips, and tricks, and organize events. Today, Monday Girl is Canada's leading networking group with over thousands of female members. And I can proudly say because of Monday Girl, today I have such a huge network and today I'm able to do better at my own job as well. So again, recommendations, how can you avoid uh, economic stress around you or help women? First, availability of more digital opportunities and facilities, particularly in emerging economies. Second, addressing gender stereotypes and facilitating awareness about gender equality, which could lead to women's access to mobile phones and improving women's digital literacy in all regions. Third, measures to promote gender diversity in funding more women entrepreneurs and empowering them via mentorship and better training facilities and eliminating biases in recruitment and selection processes for incubators or accelerators. Let's talk about digital empowerment, something that is really, really important and it needs to be focused as of now, according to me. And uh, so 49% of world still lacks internet access, mainly in developing countries and mostly women. An essential report getting to equal how digital is helping close the gender gap at work assess that if you are digitally fluent, it can provide a positive effect throughout your entire career life cycle and effect benefits women more than men. It goes on to state that if government and businesses 
can double the pace at which women become frequent users of technology, we could reach gender equality in workplace by 2040 in developed nations and by 2060 in developing nations. How can digital empowerment help women empowerment, you may ask. So this is how it can help. First, online market. Uh, online market has enabled access, easy access of raw materials and customers for finished products or services, thus facilitating ease of business for women. Second, the availability of many online courses gives an option to women with limitations on mobility to further their education. Third, many mobile apps give timely information to women about health or other needs. Fourth, women can, can learn and share their views on various issues on social platforms such as Facebook, Instagram. That's how awareness is spread as well, right? And making technology accessible and comprehensive to rural women, they can, they can be better informed about all aspects of life. And lastly, enhances small scale businesses by giving ease access to resources, guiding with knowledge and information, eliminating middlemen and the need for physical market. So how can you contribute to this problem or solve this problem uh, it, right now itself after this presentation? There are four major ways which I'll talk in detail. First, spread awareness via word of mouth and on social media because it can go viral and you never know. You might impact their lives in a major way. For, second, encourage women around you to take up initiatives or mentor them or train women. Third, have more networking sessions, groups for open female conversations such as this one. Because the moment you start a conversation, you might end up having a positive impact. You never know. And lastly, we need, we need digital tools to boost women's participation and leadership in digital space so that they, they can become leaders and active agents of change. Over to you, Afrid. Okay, thank you so much, Sharman, for your presentation. Our last speaker today is Dr. Zabelda Banji. Zabelda has dedicated her career to improving patient outcomes and healthcare delivery systems, leveraging her profound scientific acumen and exceptional business sense. With an impressive track record of diverse leadership roles, she leads cross-functional teams in biomedical sciences, program management, and business development for multi-million dollar high growth initiatives in medical innovation and digital health. She has served as a top level strategist and subject matter expert across diverse organizations from Canadian and US health authorities, hospital consortiums, pharmaceuticals, and research organizations across Canada, the US, India, Nepal, China, and the EU. Dr. Banji has earned her executive MBA from Kellogg School of Management at Northwestern University, her MS and PhD from Howard University College of Medicine, and her BSc from St. Xavier's College, Mumbai. She has strategized and supported the development of six startups with intellectual property patents and venture capital funding. As a thought leader, she has delivered countless seminars and presentations, authored peer-reviewed publications, and taught thousands of medical graduate and undergraduate students over the decades. She has led faculty appointments with Howard University and Northeastern University. She serves on the board of healthcare facilities, local NGOs, and startups. Zabelda is also a committed member of several international charitable organizations aiding in poverty alleviation, women's empowerment, stress relief through meditation, and scientific advancement. So please join me in welcoming Zabelda Banji.
Thank you for that introduction, Afrid. Give me one second to switch over to my screen. So I'm really delighted to be here with all you amazing and motivated women of CSW. We have reviewed some of the awesome research with Dr. Shroff and gone into the depths of women's social issues with Miss Mystery. I will now take you through a woman's empowerment journey, figuratively and contextually. Together, we will see how the path to women's empowerment is actually lit by an era of digital transformation, necessitating a significant systemic disruption. So let's dive in. So what we're gonna do is revisit our understanding of women's rights and gender equality together. And then we're gonna tie it in with these current trends in the health tech revolution, which has been taken up by storm with the COVID era. And then we're gonna unravel a secret. And that is to better understand the ecosystem of digital transformation. We can draft a blueprint to create innovative technologies that can drive true women's empowerment. A systemic disruption is hiding in plain sight for all NGOs, tech developers, policymakers. And if we understand the business of, business of driving such a change, we can actually create true women's empowerment. So when I was younger, I often wondered, was I really different? Is being a girl different in any way? How do we define ourselves as women? So I asked, why is there a question if a woman's rights are equal to men? Aren't we all human? Albeit we're uniquely different, but we're all human. So I want us to reiterate that women's rights are human rights. So let's try to redefine our rights so we can ascertain our next frontier of gender equality in the digital age. So based on the data from a 2021 uh, World Bank report, women's rights are broadly classified into the following areas. There are constraints on mobility or freedom of movement. There are laws affecting women at a workplace, laws in place for equitable pay, legal constraints in marriage, impact to women's work after having children, constraints in starting a business, inheritance differences based on gender, any laws impacting a woman's pension. In recent years, many economies have made women's rights a priority by eliminating job restrictions, working to reduce the gender gap, or changing legislation related to marriage and parenthood. Still, many laws continue to inhibit women's ability to enter the workforce or start a business, and even to travel outside their homes in some way as men. In, in fact, on average, globally, women have just about three quarters of the economic rights of men. So let's visualize women's rights um, across the world. And this is based on 2021. Now here's a map and this map looks very pink indeed. And now this is not in a good way. On a scale where less gender equality is denoted by the darker shades of purple on this map. There are only 10 countries that offer full legal protections on women's rights. And all of them are in the Northern hemisphere, predominantly in Western Europe. And according to this report, there are 12, sorry, 20 economies in the world where women have half or fewer legal rights as compared to men. Now, one such example is under the Taliban rule, for example, women in Afghanistan had limited access to even education and work. Today, even in the Gaza Strip, women must have permission of a male guardian to travel. Yet some differences are seen in developed countries. Even in the US, Women are only 82 cents to a dollar with, compared to a man. And there are similar gaps even in Europe. And all women, sorry, somebody's audio is on. Can we mute them? Okay. So also women are represented at only 23% of seats in national parliaments globally and make up only 13% of any agricultural landowners. This is something to really think about. So in the shadows of this pandemic, what we realize is COVID-19 has actually exasperated the existing inequalities that disadvantage women and girls. And 
often that relates to barriers to attend schools, to maintain jobs, and also impacts a lot of women that are in the in certain sectors that were impacted by the pandemic, uh, where the, there's a ton of women workers like restaurants, hospitality, business, travel sector. So to date, these leaders are debating a pre-pandemic state of recovery in a post-pandemic world. And however, women's rights and gender equality remain a central topic for social and economic development. So gender equality. Well, what are the parameters of gender equality and how long is this road ahead? So let's dive in. So the gender gap score, oh, sorry my cursor. <laughs> the gender gap score is measured using four main elements. The educational attainment, now this is a rather basic level of education, health and survival, economic participation and opportunity, political empowerment. Now, if you see world over, the average score is only 0.67, and this is a weighted average. So a weighted average would be significantly lower. Um, interestingly, only six out of 10 countries uh, that made it to the top, they were all from Western Europe. And this excludes the biggest global population that's out of India, China, Brazil, Russia. We're all still far behind. And so let's look at these metrics in a different way. So if you see here, political empowerment has the lowest score. And you can see that at the, on, on the very last row for global average. So political empowerment has the lowest score of 0.22. And you'd be surprised that even for Western Europe, it's only 0.44. So we, this is indicative that we have a lot of work ahead. We still have a very large gender gap. And globally, about only 14 countries in the world have women where there are at least 50% of ministerial positions held by them. And economic participation and opportunity is the, opportunity is the second weakest score. And in this category, the global average is 0.62. A good example of this is how the gap manifests itself in entrepreneurship, in business, where women struggle to find investors and gain access to venture capital. Further on an average, women continue to make less money. So globally, women make 77 cents to a dollar compared to men. Now, there are economic ben benefits to actually gender equality. So we have to put our thinking cap on from other modalities. Research shows that empowering women in a workforce is actually for everybody's best interest. It could lead to a boost of more than $28 trillion to the global economy if we bring about gender parity. So according to the World Economic Forum, on average, we would take 135.6 years to fill the gender gap. But this is an underestimation because for some countries it was 195 years. And this was as of 2021. But since then, the global climate has changed significantly. And now, if you saw the report just last week, March 5th, by the UN Secretary uh, stating at the CSW, he said that, you know, our gender equality is actually vanishing in front of our eyes. And this can take more than 300 years. So I'm going to jump into the health tech revolution, because the health tech revolution has been there front and center for over 100 years. Um, since the past hundred years, human life expectancy has almost doubled. And the pandemic actually highlighted some significant trends in digital health, health, and it also established a new necessity for tailoring the business of innovation. And this is gonna be a very good example for us to segue into digital transformation ecosystems, as well as digital disruption. So just very briefly, I'm just gonna take you through a quick journey. So over the years, healthcare technology has drastically evolved. Our very first stethoscope was in 1816. Our first x-ray was in 1895. But then until 1955, we had nothing going on. Like, really. <laughs> then our very first ultra ultrasound was in 1955, and our first MRI scanner was in 1977. But in the last 20 years with the advent of genomic technologies, as well as the technological era, we have been able to see some monumental growth. We have been able to see our first robotic systems for labor, uh, laparoscopic surgeries in early 2000. And the last two decades have just fueled an amazing digital age. This is where our opportunity lies. We're now seeing amazing transformative medicines such as robotic prosthetics, 
This Luke arm is so amazing. It actually communicates between the brain and the arm and enables amputees to have more sophisticated and intuitive movements. We have 3D bioprinted ears. This is almost ready and you know gonna be out of the door soon. Um, and that this is going to pave the way for regenerative medicine in live tissue printing as well as transplants. We also have a new wave and we're seeing Meta Facebook leading the way with this. So with virtual reality, we can even offer pain relief, really something that they're hoping will transform anesthesiology practices. So this VR technology is supposed to offer a distraction in surgeries that normally will require painkillers and sedatives. So the hope is that th this technique will reduce costs, recovery time, and complications for pa patients. So artificial intelligence is this next big thing. We're seeing it happening everywhere. We don't realize, but artificial intelligence is part of our online consultations with our physicians. Our automated repetitive tasks like medication management, data mining, medical record keeping, and drug dispensing. And this AI market is supposed to balloon about 16, 1,600% from 2018 to 2025. That's just two years away. So this digital age is also bringing together this thing called Internet of Things or an IoT. Now, what this IoT market is expected to grow like fivefold in the next five to seven years to 534 billion. And this is because huge amounts of data goes into this. We're having a significantly aging population with chronic diseases that are becoming more rampant and increasing healthcare costs. So IoT is sort of a pseudo solution to try to enable uh, alleviating the cost structures with healthcare. We also see mobile medicine. You know, we're expecting a 26x growth in this by 2025. We're seeing, you know, people monitoring vital stats by users, by physicians, their patient records for biochemistry, for blood, for blood work. And we're also seeing some really sophisticated technology for ultrasound scans. So why do I give you this little segue? The reason is because healthcare segment projections suggest that we're looking at about anywhere from 20 to 50% growth, CAGR, in the, by 2025. That's huge. That's an opportunity that not just women's empowerment can help be part of this, you know, they say a rising tide lifts all boats. This is an opportunity for all women for a lifetime. So let's look at what this digital transformation ecosystem is. And what we have been seeing so far has been that we've been making great strides but the digital age is actually paving the way for gender parity and political empowerment that we addressed before. Now, how you might ask, well, fundamentally understanding data-driven technologies and product innovation can address the unique needs of women and underrepresented communities, and this thereby providing a feedback loop of optimization. So there are actually four tiers of digital transformation, and this is very important. To determine an optimal digital transformation strategy, we need to understand these four tiers. These tiers can help us understand and need um, an assessment of the engagement that we want to do with our target customer. This is women, this is minorities, these are rural communities, and then focus our investments to help harness the benefits of this interactive data and then support the needs of our consumers. So if you see here, tier one, so tier one is, is the very base layer. So it's addressing operational efficiencies. This is where vast majority of the digital transformation initiatives take place. And it's especially important because it offers the strategic thrust. Key challenges in this tier include installing widespread interactive data generation as well as utilization and also breaking any silos that could be there in data sharing. Now, tier two addresses more advanced operational efficiencies. Now, this is vital because it helps us design better products that use and have access to this interactive data. And if we don't have sufficient product user interactive data, then it can really greatly impact the end users because the end users are not able to get what they require out of the tool. And this also actually greatly impacts the business for revenue generating services. And then tier three, now this is where we generate most of our data-driven service as well as our value chain. And this is very unique and very important for our target populations. This is also the rate limiting step that you can 
that that can stop your business from growing and it also impacts if you from getting into a consumption ecosystem say so like well what's the consumption ecosystem so this consumption ecosystem this is your tier 4 and this is strategically important because any product any service that we truly want to put out and make a change make true impact has to go into tier 4 and tier 4 is where we create the most important products often they are driven by digital platforms and they often help create a consumption ecosystem and they also minimize the risk of the product being commoditized so you're almost creating an effective moat around it therefore it is quite important to extend products and services into digital platforms but using data driven services and using user stats and then really understanding which customer segments we're trying to service and we need to make sure that all the value added benefits are providing a unique advantage of our product and our service to these underrepresented underrepresented communities as well as markets so we're effectively also cashing in on an untapped market demographic and this is key so this really complex but beautiful framework was put together by Webster, leveraging the work of Dr. Dweck and Daniel Goben. And herein you'll see two distinct areas. On the right, you'll see the framework represents a rather permanent business model approach, and it requires a constant analysis, development, and modification, leveraging the dynamic culture of business, engagement, the ecosystem, and at the core of all of this, this is your data analytics. And on the left is a more intermittent or more implementation of value-based model. Now, this model actually helps you prepare for your next challenge, for developing a strategy for innovation based on your value, the mindset, the, the culture, the governance models of your technology. So strategy and innovation are at the center of your business model. However, it is still value-driven. Therefore, it helps us adapt to new scenarios governed by disruption, any market dynamics that are constantly changing, change of partners, change of legal uh, rights and uh, permissions that are granted to different types of technologies, any partners and any sourcing that might, we might be doing with other countries. So bridging these two models means that transformation needs to be highly dynamic and the products or your business to thrive and survive, it needs to be agile and adaptable. And at the core where these two models meet is where we need to make sure it's highly customer centric. So finally, I guess there are opportunities and risks to digitization that we cannot ignore. So we need to make sure that, that as the opportunities are presented in front of us in the business side as well, we have to make sure that it's customer centric for women and minorities. There need to be more flexible approaches, um, for business management and work arrangements. And there's also an opportunity for enhanced implementation because you can actually leverage internal communication and remote working in this era. There's also true value and in inclusiveness because you can generate online platforms that are highly inclusive and socially accepted. And some of this also helps us with contract tracing apps if, those, if the privacy rules are properly put in place. Now, there are risks as well. So one of the significant risks is that there is sometimes an uneven pace of acceleration of digitization. And this was particularly observed um, for minorities because there are increasing inequalities uh, between different territories, you know, the Northern Territories and the Southern Territories of Canada, urban and rural areas, and also different types of citizens depending on their comfort with technology. Another example that we can really think about is telemedicine. We talk about it, how great it is, but it did also to some extent uh, provide some inequality because it was not the same quality of care or same quality standards based, compared to the traditional healthcare systems. And finally, we talk about data collection a lot. Like we all gave so much of data during COVID. Um, some of it was personal, some of it was non-personal. It depends how that's going to be actually leveraged by government bodies and making sure that we're protecting the rights and the, and the permissions that we gave during data collection. So as we see that we need to understand large amounts of chaos in our environment and aid the emergence of clarity, this is key. So systemic disruption is where clarity emerges with a keen eye into data-driven chaos. And so we're part of a new emerging era. 
And the power to execute women's empowerment has never been greater than in the current times. However, we might want to consider a high degree of vigilance amidst, amidst this contraindicative trends of war, pandemics, and any inequalities that are exasperated in a post-pandemic world or a digital world. Women's empowerment has a high probability to occur alongside systemic disruption. So I would like to leave you with some actionable takeaways. So we're in this together. And today I actually see on this call, so many of my colleagues, my friends, and you know, taking very keen interest to be here. And we're in this together, the government organizations, the NGOs, the for-profit businesses, the researchers, the policymakers, and the women and the minorities who depend on us. It's amazing that CSW gives us this platform to converse about women's issues. And as we work together to define and redefine the next era of gender equality, women's rights need to be center stage to integrating with digital transformation. We need to drive more policy and governance in favor of women's equality. And for that, we can leverage a lot of this data-driven decision-making. And we can be also more involved in understanding the consumption ecosystem that we just spoke about. And also understanding the consumption ecosystem needs to include these underrepresented people and minorities and their very specific needs. We can also leverage a lot of data-driven uh, decision-making for technological aspects, social aspects, and economic advancement. Now, this can only occur when the ecosystem is inherently super connected on infrastructures, on innovation technology, as well as the unique needs of women. So we have to make sure that the ecosystem is tied very closely. So coming full circle, the success of digital innovation and women's empowerment depends on each of us. And as we account for gender parity, we are inherently driving a value addition necessary for a consumption ecosystem and inherently driving a systemic disruption that is key for women's empowerment. So thank you. Thank you, everyone. And lastly, and most importantly, I'd like to thank all my dear colleagues, friends and family for joining in today with a keen interest in this topic. And we look forward to identify collaborations to work on women's empowerment and digital technologies together. Please be sure to connect with me on LinkedIn so we can continue these important discussions. Thank you. Okay, hey, thank you to our speakers, uh, Dr. Farah Shroff, Ms. Sharman Mystery, and Dr. Zabelda Bamji. And to all of you for joining us today, um, we're going to take any questions you have for the panel now. You can either put it in the chat window or um, you can raise your hand um, on Zoom and uh, we'll just pick on you as we see your hands come up. I'm going to uh, stop the screen share so that uh, we can all see each other. Uh, Monik Bujwala, you can unmute and ask your question. Uh, yes, uh, I had a question about, you know, whether there is a, uh, in, in, in your uh, thinking, understanding, is there a connection to the social service organizations, you know, uh, uh, especially, you know, in uh, poorer countries, in uh, village areas and all that kind of, is there some thinking about that? So do we have um, access to digital technologies in smaller areas where non-governmental organizations may be servicing the majority of people's needs? As I believe I've understood your question, my friend. Um, yes. Yes, that that absolutely is happening in many parts of the world. Just remembering that only about 64% of the people on, on earth have access to internet services. So we're still talking about vast swaths of the planet, which doesn't have any coverage at all. So a lot of what we do need to talk about is trying to bridge this digital divide, trying to make sure that people do have access. And so, so what I understand you saying is, so how are we going to make sure that people living in poverty, people living in rural villages get access? 
And that's still a challenge, but it is getting better. We, we see this slow um, coverage of internet actually increasing the world over, but yet it's 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 nowhere near um, equal. And, and, and as I mentioned in my presentation, even when one family has access to internet, it's usually the male head of household who has, um, we'll say it's a smartphone or something like that. And so it can be a little bit difficult, even though, you know, in theory, everybody's sharing the technology. It isn't usually done in a very equitable fashion. So it's usually um, better access for men. Um, uh, yeah, I, I, I can tell you, I did, um, I, I did a photo voice research project in the country where I was born in Kenya a couple of years ago. Well, a couple of years prior to the pandemic. And um it was this project where uh, uh, people in this tiny little village in central Kenya, I, I said, could you please take a picture of yourself within a 24 hour period? And the women's pictures that came back, it was a very rural area. So women were doing farming work. They were um, milking the cow. They were cleaning the cow stall. They were out and doing gardening and weeding and things like that um, and playing with the children, with the chickens. And a lot of the, men, the men's images were them on the computer or them actually on another phone. Um, and so even this photo voice project made it really clear to me that men do have greater access to technology and want to show that they have good access to technology. There's not only a digital divide within, um, within nations according to, to income or between nations according to uh, in income, but within nations according to gender. So there, there are many, many ways in which we do need to bridge this digital divide. Thank you. <laughs> we have a question in the chat window from Matina Avery. Um, her question is, what is the impact of technology on the sexual health of women? Anyone on the panel she hasn't chosen anyone to answer? Yeah, so I work in uh, women's health and I work in, um, in, in sexual health. Uh, so uh, part of our study was talking to women's health providers and people who uh, provide sexual health services to women. Um, certainly, Access to various forms of birth control was more limited during the pandemic, and that is one of the reasons why so many of us were recommending um, over-the-counter kinds of birth control options, um, such as condoms. Um, a, a, the, a majority of, of birth control usually is under women uh, is left to women to to do um so the pill is very popular the iud is actually the world's largest form of birth control and um and during the pandemic uh if women didn't have access to uh, to going and getting refills for their prescriptions um for the pill or they couldn't go and get inserts for an uh, intrauterine device the iud um, then we were trying to encourage people to use condoms, um, which does necessitate a shift in gender relations because so much of birth control has been put in women's hands. And, um, and so these kinds of changes hopefully have actually made a difference. We don't know yet. I don't know. I haven't checked any data yet to see if it actually has made a difference. Um, abortion provision uh, was done uh, a lot more medical abortions were performed. I, I actually did some extensive research in uh, in Canada on this. Um, so sexual health services in many ways were strained and in other ways um, were actually the, 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 the idea that things needed to change did actually change things. Um, so in terms of abortion services, uh, I believe that uh, that access wasn't limited as much as we thought it would be. Uh, so th that's that aspect of sexuality birth control. Then just the aspect of sexual activity itself. What we do know is that fertility rates went down during the pandemic. There's always a, a in a time of uncertainty that people aren't um, they aren't thinking to procreate. They're worried about the future, and just sexual activity itself also went down. Um, uh, we, we know that that's been happening for a number of years pre-pandemic, that youth are not engaging in sex as much as the youth of the past were. Um, and that's partially related to this digital technologies, actually, to the ways in which people are engaging um, digitally and not so much um, developing social skills. Um, 
Uh, so yes, so sexual activity is down, is down for many reasons, yeah. Thank you, Farah. Um, sorry, Matina, I know you uh, lost connection in between, so I hope you did get Farah's answer. If not, um, there's a link to the recording of this, so hopefully you'll be able to listen to her answer. Uh, the next question is from Karishma. Um, she's asking a two-part question. How do you increase the impact of your positive work? Um, one, by engaging governments, and two, by engaging families through activities. And she just says, kudos on your work. Um, Karishma, we actually already discussed what actions people can take in general um, as part of each of the presentations. So if you do listen to the recordings, you can go over the action items that we've listed um, under each of the presentations for people that can actually do this in their own communities at home. Um, but if any one of you wants to answer the question in terms of engaging governments, please go ahead. Well, really, um, my field is health, uh, public health, and um, in most parts of the world, it's governments that absolutely have to do health. Um, without government involvement and governments directing health services, um, we we tend to ignore the needs of marginalized communities and people who, who aren't able to pay for services. Um, so usually health services are actually done by governments, certainly in the country where I live in Canada, um, not necessarily here in the country where I am right now in the United States, a lot of um, not for profit organizations do provide care. Um, but it, it, it is I, I work in global public health, and I'm just about to move to Abuja, Nigeria to work with the Federal Ministry of Health there. Um, I've done work with governments all over the world, including in Canada. Um, and it, it is critical, it is critical, even though um, we see that governments are having less and less control with um, trade agreements like NAFTA and things like that. Um, it's vital in, in my field to work with governments and, uh, and we need to make sure that we're having fair and free elections so that we do have democratically elected governments who represent their people. That's very well said. I can add a little bit to this. Um, so I think that, yes, Karishma, great question. So with the NHS in the UK and as well as Health Canada, um, we often find that governments are regulated and limited to doing only so much. So very often, if you're truly trying to do global impact, of some kind of new technology, some kind of emerging technology, and we actually want to include a lot of minorities, we can have very customized models where we support and engage, uh, engage governments for those minorities. But truly mass adoption requires that businesses also participate heavily alongside governments. And we often see that actually in the US because US is you know, fundamentally a capitalistic society. However, what drives them is that they, they have a very strong integrated system between the government bodies, as well as, you know, top pharma or top tech companies that influence the next cycle of growth. And I think that, yes, definitely engaging governments is key, but I think governments as well as businesses need to work very closely if we want to truly make any systemic change. And then to your point about engaging families through activities. Now, this is where NGOs can take on a much more significant role because a lot of engagement has to happen in a localized fashion. So no matter how uh, we're thinking globally, sometimes we still need to act locally. And to be able to drive that, we need to actually have a lot of close participation with NGOs. Um, and sometimes those NGOs are also funded by government bodies. I'm sure that's that's true for the US, uh, UK as well as Canada. Um, the US also has a huge amount of money that goes towards um, Medicare, other NGOs. And so there is for-profit and non-profit uh, budgeting that happens throughout. And a lot of multi-year planning with government bodies does include that. And so definitely this is something that we're not, you know, nobody's working in silos. We'll have to work very collectively. And thank you so much for that amazing question. The next question is from Robert Copeland. And he asks, any thoughts on how digital innovation would increase educational opportunities in urban areas, particularly for people of color? 
Um, Dr. Well, Copeland is actually my mentor. I have known him for 15 years and I'm going to, sorry for, I'm going to jump in and take that question because he's been so many things to me. I cannot even say he's been a mentor. He's been a father figure. I am everything I am today because of him. So my heart goes out to him. And um, his question is something that has been close to my heart for a long time too, because a lot of times there is true disparity in the way people of color uh, experience a digital ecosystem versus people that are, you know, um, the larger majority. So I would say that a lot of times digital innovation needs to be targeted towards minorities, understanding their very, very unique needs. Now, unique needs can differ from urban areas to rural areas, but people of color have their own specific unique needs. So I think a lot of times education has been one of the imp impediments in their growth, in their entire life trajectory. And I think that sometimes devising tools, especially education tools that are highly structured around being um, digitized and remote is really giving us a newfound opportunity, which was not there before. Like, you know, let's talk about even 60 years ago and very closely working with Dr. Copeland. Um, I remember stories from close friends who've told me they couldn't fill even gas at a gas station in Washington, D.C. 60 years ago. And that was mind blowing. And, you know, Dr. Copeland has been there sharing those conversations with me. So definitely today we're not experiencing those same challenges. We're not experiencing physical challenges, but we can we can bypass some of the other um, digital challenges. So we can once everything is created in an ecosystem, which is cloud based, it's open. It's open access to everybody. There is no divergence in accessibility for one versus another, as long as you have, of course, a strong Internet. And so that we need to work closely with you know, tech providers and companies across the world. And, and to that, I want to add that for countries like the U.S. and Canada, there are still a lot of spots where there is no Internet. And we need to take a book out of the lesson from India, because what Reliance and Geo did for India, it truly brought all of India on a digital platform with equitable access. And so this is something that can be, you know, slam dunk, really do it fast <laughs> to be able to, you know, provide those accessible services to people that are in the remote areas and people of color. Thank you. Thank you so much, um, Dr. Bamji. And and um, I don't know you, Dr. Copeland, but I, 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 I'm I so happy to hear about the support that you've provided to Dr. Bamji. Um, I do a lot of anti-racism work. And here in North America, I do believe that digital technologies can make a huge amount of work, uh, can provide a huge amount of benefit for communities of color. For example, um, programs that that try to teach um, many of us who are not born in this continent about our our ancient heritage, about our ancestral traditions. There's so many of those for people of African heritage here. Connecting people to somebody in the motherland, to learn about their culture, to hear how people talk, to see um, how people live, just to be able to reach across borders, to reach um, within one nation, to talk to other people who come from the same cultural, ethnic, um, or linguistic community. Technology offers a lot. Um, we see right now in Iran, if it wasn't for technology, we wouldn't know what's happening right now in the revolution as it's progressing. And even though the government is clamping down on a lot of it, people are still able to use circuitous routes. You know, Iranians are really good at tech solutions. <laughs> so many engineers are figuring out how to get the information out. So I think for communities of color, um, particularly because we live in a world which is so Euro dominated and where white supremacy is such a problem, Technology really does offer solutions for democratization, community organizing, and, and um, finding ways to, to find each other, to grow stronger, to have our voices that are more collective and uniting. Thank you, Farah and Zabelda, for that. Like um, our I next question. Well, I think Dr. Next. Copeland wants to say something. Afri, can, can we okay. let him jump in? Sure. One of the reasons I kind of really brought that up is because within urban environments, it's, it's a, a major digital divide within, I'm in Washington, D.C., 
And there's a major digital, digital divide in the city itself, particularly in people that live, we say, across the, the river uh, in terms of educational opportunities that are there. And, and I was reading a report um, a couple of weeks ago, I believe it was in Philadelphia, where they said every single high school, inner city, I believe Philadelphia or Baltimore, but no students were at the proficient level for math and science. And it just, just blew me away. I, I said, you gotta be kidding. But then I, I took a trip to Philadelphia to, to, to give a, a talk to a boys' school there. And I was just amazed really at the lack of a lot of um, uh, computerization that they have. And I understand to some degree why it's difficult for them to really compete in a world where you have so much computerization and, and everything is digitalized and they're struggling uh, along because they, they just don't have the opportunity that is there. And I was just wondering, how, how do we kind of close that gap? Because I, I had talked before, um, I, I was invited to give a talk to a, a subcommittee in Congress some years ago. And I talked about this uh, digital divide in an urban setting, not the rural setting. We know about that, but the urban setting where I said that where we have people of color that live basically 300 yards away from a, from a hospital cannot find information about their own diseases. And I said, this is truly a tragedy, uh, especially living in Washington, D.C. But it, you know, I'm just wondering about other cities across the, the country, other cities across the world. I'm just, just wondering about those things there. So I would really like to add that we have a lot of really eminent speakers on this call. And I, I, I don't want to take names, but we have CEO of Harbinger here. We have one of the top people from the State Department here. And we have some, you know, senior directors as well as an IT. Um, and we also have some legal, top legal personnel on this call. So I would love for you guys, and you know who you are. So I would love for you to turn on your camera and please participate in this discussion because I'm sure you have some really great insights to share. In the meanwhile, we do seem to have a hand up, right? Rustam Bopti has his hand up. Yeah. Yes, hello, oh, good afternoon. Finished. Can you hear me? Yeah. Hello, can you hear me? Yes, we can hear you. Yes. You know, this wonderful presentation that you have given, I am amazed that the very topic you raise, that this gender equality, inequality due to this advanced technologies and all are not reaching the, causing some issues. Actually, when I asked this just a few minutes ago, I sent a message, can I see the recording of this presentation and your administrator kindly send me a link to the YouTube of this. Now imagine with this YouTube, I can send this pres very presentation to all family and friends I have around the world. So same way, through YouTube, women will be able to send, some women who do have not attended some sessions, they were not allowed to, they can ask their friends. friends are Will be spread all over the world. So I think that you're right, it's not being done now. But I think it's going to be a wonderful tool to spread this information. And thank you all for being aware of it. Yes, indeed. Sorry, am I? Oh, you uh, are you are you done? Sorry. Yes, sir, I'm done. I, I I think there's there's something um, really synchronous about doing a presentation about women and uh, women's rights and women's health and digital te technology while we are on digital technology. And so I thank you for just pointing out the the possibilities of using these technologies uh, for spreading the word about these topics and about the excitement that, we have generated here today about really trying to harness technologies to improve our lives. And I, I do wanna just say one thing, um, when we improve the lives of women, what we know is that women typically 
lift up other people. Um, that's why I founded this organization, Maternal and Infant Health Canada, because we're very, very sure that when we educate and lift up women, women will lift up children, women will lift up the people in their own generation, they will lift up the people in the generation above them. Women are key to changing the world. So when we help women with literacy and better health and more access to resources, we change our world for the better. Sharman, would you like to add something? Uh, nothing really, because I'm learning so much from all of y'all at this point, being the youngest participant and uh, now just learning and re hearing whatever discussion is happening. And it's really interesting to know the thoughts all over the world. And uh, thank you so much for uh, your positive uh, words. Um, I see the chat. And um, all of y'all have, have such amazing, um, firstly, all of y'all are really good. And thank you for your kind words. They mean a lot to us because we've worked almost three to four months for this presentation and hearing uh, things like amazing and great presentation, it, they mean a lot to us. So appreciate each one of y'all. Thank you so much. So, Farah, do you want to take that? Do you want me to take that? Yeah, oh, I'm sorry. I, so I, I, there's I, another question by Gita. Um, she says, why is technology improvement important to Iranian Zoroastrian women in Iran? How is technology empowering Iranian Zoroastrian women in Iran? I, I'm really happy to, to take a a stab at that and, and then leave it to you, um, Dr. Bamji, if that, if that would be okay. Um, so I, I will just say I'm married to an Irani. Um, this is a very, very important issue to me in my personal life. I've done as much as I can to support the people of Iran. It's, it's a women-led revolution. And uh, we need to keep talking about it. I really want all of us to keep talking about it. That's why I dedicated my portion of the talk to the women and the men and the transgendered people and the non-binary people to everybody in Iran today. It's led by women, but everybody, uh, almost everybody is part of it. Um, so technology is key and it always has been key in Iranian social movements. Um, that is the way that people talk with each other and move away from the dictatorial government that they live with. Um, it's very, very important that people have media that they can talk with. Now, the Iranian government is also very, very good at stifling um, communication via digital technology. It's a highly um, a, a technolo technologically sophisticated society. So while social movements are, are good at using a, a social media and all kinds of digital technology, the government's also very quick at clamping down on it. Um, and, and so that's really one of the reasons why the world has to keep supporting Iran and keep supporting human rights in Iran, because it's the rest of the world that's going to make the difference. Um, so however we can support, and really one of the best things we can do is to keep talking about it, keep letting people know, the ones who are getting jailed, the ones who are going out on the streets, risking their lives. Every day people are risking their lives for their, for their basic rights to be fully human, um, for us to keep supporting them. And just one last thing I have to say, if we really want to choke the Iranian regime right now, we need to cut off their means to financial resources. And that means banking access. I haven't figured out how to do that. I've been, I've been creating these calls for action with every organization I belong to, uh, but I, I, nobody can tell me which banking institutions are working with the regime. So once we figure that out, I'll be putting that out on, on all the media too. Charmin? So um, I would like to add something uh, uh, from what uh, Farah said. Um, it's not basically about just Iranian Zoroastrian women. Firstly, I feel like if technology is given to every woman who do not have access at this point, it can help each and every uh, person in the family. Because uh, as I mentioned in my presentation as well, if you educate and give technology access to 
women in general you w- won't really realize but uh, it's going to have a major impact even on uh, the grandparents or children because mother is basically the main person in the family believe it or not like even when it comes to finances uh, if it's given to a woman she will make sure there are more savings not being biased but i've seen it in my own family so um even uh, places like africa or uh, india if you give access to uh, technology to females in general they will make sure it is made uh, it's it's done in a productive way and they will also uh, empower other women as well as children in their family to do that so i would say it's a win win situation in both ways and that's how it's going to improve the entire world beautifully said sharman i definitely agree that we we don't realize that an empowered woman truly empowers her entire family and from something as small as being able to you know highlight certain things that maybe their children need to see or their husband needs to see or their family members need to see and because a woman is driven not being self-centered but more how can this make it better for everyone and so very often driving that change with women at the center fold really helps and so that's really beautiful you said chairman do we have more questions in the chat? We would love no, for some don't. of you to... No, we do? We don't. We don't, okay. Do we have people that would like to come off and turn on their cameras as and then step in and chat with us? Like, really, this is supposed to be a great open discussion. Yeah, we'd love that. Yeah, please put your camera on if you're comfortable with doing that and just jump in. We have time to talk. That's why we... We shortened our presentations um, so that we would have this time. We Karishma. have about eight minutes. Yeah, we have Ketayun, we have Karishma here, we have Valerie Dumas, okay. we have Anil Singhal, oh, Deborah, Deborah from Art of Living. Deborah, would you like to add? Ketayun, yes, sure, please yes, jump in. Well, I would like to thank all the presenters today. Awesome uh, knowledge shared with us, a ton of information given. I have a question of all the opportunities presented to us today on this uh, session, how can Fazana help you get and take action on implementing some of the actions or projects you're working on? I know Afrid and Behram do a fantastic job on this UN NGO committee, but what is the next step for all of us? It's lovely to hear what you have said and very empowering as women, but what can we do next to involve other women and get them to step in to help you all achieve what you have said? So as a team, we actually discussed a ton of ideas and I don't want to talk too much. I'm just going to say one sentence and segue it to the people who can build on it. So we talked about really a lot of CSR funding as well. There are a lot of companies that need to put some of their CSR funds towards technology. We have some senior level CEOs and you know, solution architects that need to work closely in designing tools for us. We also have other NGOs and Deborah, I'm gonna turn to you for this, but Deborah is trying to lead a women's empowerment initiative with IAHV. Um, and so really we don't have to work in silos. We need to work closely with other NGOs. So using this platform as a tool to really network and connect with others. Deborah, would you like to add something? Uh, thank you very much. I appreciate very much, Dr. Bamji. I agree completely, and that is what I was going to say as well. One thing, that the important thing is to keep the conversation going. We all have our own groups. We have uh, other groups that we could join. Now that we have this really important information, and truthfully, some of it I found quite shocking in that the amount of empowerment around the world is shrinking rather than growing. And to see the compartmentalization of where that is and where we can make contributions um, through the inter IAHB, which is the International Association for Human Values, women's empowerment is a crucial platform. And that's one that I look forward to working further on with members of uh, all the people over here. Um, one of our initiatives actually um, has been buzzing in my head because it's um, Ayurveda mother and infant. It's teaching 
many, many aspects of Ayurveda to women, which is kitchen wellness, but one in particular is proper massage, how to massage the babies, how to massage infants, and even young children ask for it because we all know the importance of touch. Uh, research is showing that one of the, that the most important sense is that of touch, and we've lost that through COVID. And now I'm sure many of you like myself, when you finally do get together with people, the interaction, it's all new. It's fresh in some ways. Sometimes it's pleasant and sometimes it's not. Sometimes we spend 20 minutes with someone and we're exhausted afterwards because we're not used to that kind of touch. And I don't, this kind of touch is one way, but this is touch as well, the energy around us all. Um, so I would say if we keep our intention high, and keep our intention where we want it to go. Um, it's very much now understood that when we have an intention, awareness grows in that area and manifestation happens. So I am intention, awareness, manifesta manifestation. Keep that thought in your head and let's work together. I look forward to further conversations. And I think general conversations, I remember years ago, if I may just take a moment, it was said that um, the um, the masculine higher the masculine masculine way of of organizing is hierarchical, and that's what we're very used to. The female way of organizing is circular. We get together over coffee. We talk for three quarters of the time in general, and then the last quarter of the time, we know who can do what and where people's passions are. And leadership shifts according to a program. Somebody's good at starting, somebody's good at maintaining, somebody's good at finishing, that's fine. Working together, we can do it all. Working individually, we're gonna burn out. So, thank you so much for this really inspiring, inspiring, conversations, presentations, your devotion, your enthusiasm is actually uh, um, opening up in my mind and my heart, many, many things. It's, uh, it's uh, coming through the screen as I'm sure it is to everybody. Thank you, Deborah. Can I just um, quickly say thank you to Deborah and just to, to let you know, um, I do a lot of work in Ayurveda. UNESCO has just commissioned me to write their high-level technical piece on Ayurveda. I've been doing a lot of researching and work in Ayurveda for many years. I'm also a yoga teacher and a meditator, and I teach um, yoga and different types of meditation and dance and things like that. Um, but I just talked with a, a new colleague just this morning at Columbia University, a physician, about doing a clinical trial in India using um, yoga as a treatment for osteoporosis for women, which is his area of research. So uh, it seems like we have a lot in common. I've got another yoga study that I'm just writing up, yoga and Ayurveda study for maternal health in India, which I'm just writing up, which our organization Maternal and Infant Health Canada did. So lots and lots of synergy there. I look forward to further conversations and our working together. I bringing this knowledge forward to more and more people worldwide, men and women, we all do it together. Thank you, Charmin. Yeah, I wanted to add it to uh, the entire discussion and say that mentorship is very, very important for we females, because if one female empowers another female, it can ha have a huge impact and someday she can become a leader as well. And uh, I would want to say that I'm a good example for that because I was empowered by two females in the community itself. I would want to give a shout out to them. Uh, one is Tanya Hoshi, who is actually leading the social media and making sure this is going on YouTube in time, as well as going on Facebook and Instagram. So thank you so much, Tanya. And secondly, another leader was San Sanaya Master, who is now in Vancouver, and she made sure I am taking part in this entire discussion and uh, she empowered me as well to take the risk and motivated me to the core so thank you so much and this is a good example of mentorship and leadership so someday if you see a potential in a female empower her and make sure that you that she becomes a leader tomorrow because because you never know she might just do something unexpected and of course, I'm a I'm the only board member in Fizana, 
and uh, this was only because of female empowerment so thank you so much you're doing great charmin we're very proud of you thank you so much okay thank you all for joining us this is all the time that we have today and we had some really good discussions and uh, three really good presentations. I have put the link to the recording in here, but just in case you don't have the link on YouTube, you can always search for Fizana, F-E-Z-A-N-A, -E and all of our um, videos are posted there. Just look for the CSW67 video and you'll find this one. Thank you so much. Thank you all for joining. Bye, have everybody. Thank you so much. Bye. Bye. Thank Bye. you. Bye, Dali. Bye, Bye Katayan. Bye. Now Rose, Bye. Now, Rose now, Rose Mubarak. Now, Rose Mubarak in advance to everybody. Now, now Rose Mubarak. Now, Rose uh, Mubarak. Yeah. Awesome. Kudos to Fazana, the whole team, how you work across boundaries, how you work across generations, how gentlemen like Dr. Behram Pastakia works with the ladies and Uncle Rointon, and how the ladies work together to empower people across the globe. It's just yeah. fantastic and model to emulate. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Arzan, you're okay? Thank you. Thank you. Arzan, you're okay to close the meeting? Yes. Okay, thank you. Yeah, I'll do that. Okay. Thank you, Arzan and Fazana for hosting this session and Viram and Afri too. Thank, Thank you. See you all on Friday for the Nowruz concert. Oh, yeah. Friday, 9 p.m. <clears throat>